I, I think that people in the United States don't see, and I don't think, as much as I, I appreciate occupation of Wall Street, occupied Wall Street, I don't think there are any alternatives, and so that people haven't been challenged by them to want to get up and actually go out and do anything, but I think the economic crisis is going to drive people into the streets because <coughs> the employment is going to get far worse. There are a variety of different ways to sort of buy off Americans, you know, but I think that if the balance of forces begins to change in the United States, where people actually do get involved because they need to be involved, um, I think the police will have no hesitation in the military to come in as they have in the past and shoot people. After Suharto fell, the uh, successor government led by a man named Habibi, uh, the go successor government of Indonesia, they quickly did an assessment of where they stood, where the regime was. And um, the recommendation came back that the continued occupation of, of Timor was killing them because it was in, endangering their American support. Uh, and so Habibi and the Indonesian central government agreed finally to uh, a free vote in Timor, a referendum where the Ch Timorese could decide on their own future. And this was held under uh, UN supervision in, in 1999. And in the run-up to the referendum, uh, the Indonesian military organized uh, militias uh, and um, started to uh, intimidate and assassinate and uh, massacre Timorese around the country. Uh, in hopes of pressuring them to vote ag against independence. And in the midst of this, uh, the, uh, the U.S. commander, military commander in the Pacific, Dennis Blair, who later became President Obama's intelligence chief, um, sat down with General Wuranto, the Indonesian military commander, and basically gave him a green light to proceed uh, with this uh, with this terror. Um, and uh, they went as far as going into churches like the one in Likisa and you know, massacring the people who were taking refuge there. In the case of Likisa, they used machetes to hack them up and you know, there, there was uh, flesh, human flesh stuck to the walls uh, afterward uh, in the direct aftermath of uh, General, uh, Admiral Blair's uh, recommendation. And while this was happening, uh, the, the armed Timorese uh, rebels, uh, commanded by Shinana Gushmao, who you referred to, um, they had agreed to um, uh, go into a, a cantonment area, um, which is probably what you're referring to, under UN supervision, uh, where, where they were there. And Shinana uh, and the others made the decision to uh, hold back uh, as these massacres in the run-up to the election were occurring. And uh, I, I talked to Shannon about this, uh, you know, right afterward. And he said it was a very bitter decision. Uh, and there was a little bit of dissent. There were a couple of uh, people in the rebel movement who objected to it. But overwhelmingly, they supported uh, that decision. The, the, the consensus of the, of the fighters and also of the Timorese population uh, was that they were doing the right thing by holding back because they knew they, they could see the victory within sight. They knew that if they could hold off until uh, election day and the vote which they knew they were going to win uh, in a landslide, that the political forces uh, would be such that that would be the, the end of the occupation. And that's exactly how it worked out. Um, and, you know, the belief of the Timorese and, and the fighters was that that was the right decision. And also, they, they didn't have the capacity to, uh, to, to stop those uh, massacres. You know, they had been fighting this Indonesian army for decades. They, they had never been able to stop these massacres. So they made absolutely the right decision there, um, in the opinion of the Timorese, and, and also in, in my opinion. Um, but in terms of the U.S., I don't think that, that the U.S. can turn back the clock. Um, in terms of repression and go back to, uh, you know, the old assass assassinations of the, uh, uh, of the 70s or the, the massacres of the, 
labor organizers of the turn of the century or the, the early part of the, the 20th century, <coughs> if they tried to pull that today, uh, if they tried to get, get the American cops out to, you know, to gun down demonstrators in mass, I think a lot of those cops would, would rebel. They, they would not take the order. Uh, all hell would break loose. Uh, it would be the breakdown of, uh, of authority in the, uh, you know, in the, in the American security apparatus. They just, uh, I, they can't get away with that now. It's, it's a different world we're in. And also, uh, in terms of violence, the, you mentioned, you know, American workers arming themselves. Uh, I think that would be insane. Um, uh, if any American workers attempted to arm themselves for political purposes, and the last time that was really seriously talked about was by the Black Panthers in the, uh, in the 70s, and they were some of those who were assassinated, um, uh, they would be overwhelmingly repudiated by the American population, and it would be a massive victory uh, for, the, you know, uh, the, the American rich and, uh, you know, the, the establishment. Um, in other countries, it's, it's, diff it's a different situation. For example, in Egypt and Tunisia, although the coverage here downplayed it, um, I think the, the brief use of, of violence by the, the people who were doing the uprising was essential to the success of those uprisings. Because a few days and a few weeks into those, they went and stormed the secret police headquarters. And they, you know, they burned them to the ground and uh, the secret policemen uh, fled. Uh, and <coughs> and uh, uh, these were crucial moments that, that en enabled uh, these uprisings to succeed. Conversely, in Honduras, when there was a very strong movement, um, uh, a, a massive grassroots protest movement, which persists to this day in Honduras, uh, that was uh, triggered by the, uh, basically the coup that was de facto supported by the U.S. government, in which the democratically elected President Zelaya, an oligarch who kind of turned against the oligarchy in, in limited ways. You know, he was ousted and the people tried to rally in his defense. Um, people came out to try to stop that coup, to try to turn it back. Uh, and they didn't succeed in the end. And uh, one incident that happened in the midst of that movement, which uh, was a few months ago, a, a guy who was very involved in it told me this story. Um, they were considering uh, trying to storm, trying to arm themselves and storm some of the, the military and police posts and, and confront the, the Honduran military. And given the conditions on the ground there, they really thought that that might work, uh, th that that might move the uprising forward uh, kind of in the same way that it, uh, similar actions did in Tunisia and, and Egypt uh, and elsewhere. But they went to Zelaya. Uh, who at that time was, had already been ousted, but he was still the head. They recognized their movement was structured in a way that they recognized him as their head, uh, and they had that kind of system of accountability. They went to Zelaya, and they essentially asked his permission. Uh, and Zelaya responded, well, I see what you mean, uh, but I'm sorry I can't uh, uh, agree to this because of you know, the possible repercussions. Uh, and it was a case where kind of the usual um, uh, platitudes, uh, the, the usual bromides we have about what is good in politics and organization were kind of turned on their head. Because in that case, uh, it was precisely the, uh, uh, the presence of accountability. Because uh, uh, Zelaya knew that he would be held accountable uh, if people took up arms, uh, led to a decision which probably hurt uh, that uprising. Whereas in Egypt and Tunisia, because the, these were kind of mass flowing crowds, nobody exactly knew what was going on. There was a lack of accountability of the people. There was also a lack of transparency. You know, we all talk about transparency, but in that case, nobody knew who was doing what. Uh, all we knew was that somebody just stormed the secret police and set them fleeing. Somebody, you know, just stormed the military and set them fleeing. And that worked out very well. But this all depends on the nature of the society, the nature of the regime, the nature of the repression. Um, 
And uh, in today's U.S., a a any kind of armed action like that would be uh, disastrous, completely uh, uh, counterproductive. Uh, uh, I think in, in today's U.S., um, the kind of courageous mass actions that are not um, <coughs> in themselves violent, but that are forceful, that involve you know people going in and uh, moving into forbidden areas and putting their bodies on the line, and maybe in some cases you know breaking up some property if it's uh, necessary. Those kinds of actions can win support of the majority of the population, as a, you know, a lot of these actions already have, uh, and therefore can succeed. I, I think there's tremendous potential there, but the arm stuff would be nuts. The image of several, even a, even a half million people in Washington, and then scaling the fence on the White House, and then not invoking a very strong response, is extremely unrealistic. Uh, not because it can't happen, but because there's no yet public legitimacy for that. I mean, this, I felt like it collapsed 10,000 stages. The public is not yet ready for an assault on the White House. I will certainly not see it as legitimate. We're way, way off. There's a long time in the future before that kind of assault will be seen as legitimate uh, by a majority of the American people. Uh, so I thought. Uh, that scenario, this is a crucial point in any politics, which is you have to have a clear sense of where the public is at, and what they're ready to accept, what they consider is legitimate, and what they consider is illegitimate. Uh, uh, that's just an observation. Now I'm going to ask a very boring brass tax, but tax question, because it's something that more and more I'm trying to make sense of. Uh, namely, the experience that you had, which is in one respect very encouraging, how a small handful of people can have a very large impact on U.S. foreign policy. Uh, you use the figure of pretty small numbers. You then use the figure of 10,000, which is actually a very large number, in my opinion. But I assume when you're saying 10,000, you're including everybody on the web who sends an email. That's what you mean by 10,000. You're not meaning 10,000 activists. No, no, that's, that's a huge, huge number. The, the largest demonstration in the time was ever involved in um, 300. Yeah, 300. That's, and still, a small handful of people can exert a huge impact and have saved many lives. And so the question of East Timor, which has always puzzled me, is how applicable the experience of your little group is to other issues on the uh, political agenda. So you take the obvious case, Israel begins the occupation of the uh, West Bank in Gaza, in East Jerusalem in 67, Timor in 74, roughly the same period of time. Of course, the massacre in Timor, we want to make those comparisons, is totally in a different category from anything that ever happened in the occupied territory since 1967. <coughs> and then you look at the political configuration. Israel is allied, excuse me, U.S. is allied with Israel. U.S. is allied with Indonesia. In both cases, countries carry out <coughs> occupations. And in both cases, the U.S. has no real stake in the occupation. The U.S. doesn't really care if Indonesia is occupying Timor or not. It's not a major issue for them. And in my opinion, same thing, Israel, the U.S. has no real stake in Israel occupying the U.S. in Gaza. If tomorrow Israel left, it would be like tomorrow, yesterday, Indonesia leaving Timor. There were no big tears in Washington, quite the contrary. So at the big level, the macro level, they seem similar. So now, where does the analogy collapse, if it does? And why does it collapse? Now, what's applicable from your experience, and what is just unique to this strange constellation of political power for East and more U.S. and the Strong actions have to be backed by a large portion of the population. Being a leader means uh, taking uh, the lead, and for a group, you know, 
uh, can leap out front and then take people with them, but you have to have a reasonable expectation that you will bring people with you. Um, the image of going over the White House fence is not something that you know, would make sense uh, this month. But I would not be stunned if uh, it might make sense within the coming year. In 1968, it almost came to that. If you go back and read the uh, accounts of the, the Nixon White House, uh, there were moments when the, uh, the anti-war demonstrators were right outside the gates and were besieging the place, and the, uh, the, White, the Nixon White House people were physically in a, in a panic, and they were fearing precisely that, that, that people might come over that uh, fence, and you know, that anti-war movement did not have majority uh, support yet at that moment, but it had big support. And also, if you look at the polls, uh, there, there were some remarkable Gallup polls and Harris polls of, from that time of American business leaders and so on. And majorities of uh, American business and opinion leaders actually feared revolution in the, in the United States. They, at, that, at that moment, I mean, it seems inconceivable now, but this, this was real. This, the, they felt that this might be on the verge of happening at, uh, at any moment in the U.S. Um, and that was because th that happened to be one of those historical moments where, for various reasons, uh, events accelerate. Uh, and we may be, and maybe not, you know, maybe this spring will be dead, but I don't think so. We, we may be on the, uh, the brink, if we make it so, one of those moments where uh, things really do accelerate and happen very quickly, and where it may be conceivable that there is as much uh, uh, of a constituency for, str or, or more of a constituency for, you know, really strong mass action as there was in uh, in '68. That now on the the other point of, uh, you know, the Timor, the successful Timor activism lobby model and how it applies to other things. Um, uh, I think generally you could say that. It applies to the whole list of countries that are um, below the radar of, of the big corporate press, that are not in the, the news on a, on a daily uh, basis. So, you know, if you actually got out the uh, uh, defense uh, appropriations bill and the foreign operations uh, appropriations bill, and made an inventory of all the repressive regimes that were uh, receiving uh, weapons and training and uh, what they call economic support funds from, the, uh, from Washington. You'd have a list of about 35 or 40 uh, regimes, most of them completely unknown uh, to the American uh, public. And an effort of the type that was mounted on Timor, I think, could be, you know, similarly ap applied to in, in each of those cases uh, maybe w with some success. And John m mentioned a very important point, and that is that when you get down to the reality of doing politics in, uh, in Congress, the, the picture that we get from the, the media coverage and from the education we get in the schools has very little relevance. Uh, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, uh, those categories don't necessarily mean what you think they do. When you really look at the details of particular uh, uh, cases, um, you'll find surprising enemies uh, and surprising uh, allies. I mean, uh, there were uh, liberal Democrats uh, who were uh, some of the, the fiercest supporters of U.S. backing for the, you know, for the Indonesian military. And there were conservative Republicans <coughs> who, for various complex reasons, were, uh, uh, were opponents. There's, there's the, the coverage of, what actual, of how decisions are actually made in Washington is horrible. I mean, even if you read, like, the insider political press, like, you know, Politico, this, uh, you know, the online uh, 
Journal of Politics in Washington. You can read that every day, and you still wouldn't have a clue of how things are actually uh, done in, uh, uh, in Congress in, in Washington. And there's some complexity to it. And yes, as, as you'd expect, uh, a fair amount of it is about money. Um, but a lot of it is not about money. In the case of Timor, we had zero money. And I mean zero money when, uh, when, uh, when we started. I mean, there were a number of occasions uh, where um, uh, we're negotiating with people in congressional offices about trying to get a certain amendment or reworded or trying to get a rider put on a bill and uh, had to send a fax. Well, the fax machine still existed back then. Had to send a fax down to the offices in question because it was too expensive to take the train down to, uh, to Washington. Uh, a couple of years later, we were able to establish a Washington office with, you know, with, with, one, uh, uh, with one person. But this was a, an absolute shoestring operation and it was done in opposition first to the Bush administration, the Dr Bush senior administration, then the Clinton administration, and at various points along the way to paid lobbyists who were hired by the Indonesian government, who never really did anything, but they, they, spread, al they spread around some money. Um, and it was able to succeed in part because, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to run the world. For the U.S. government, it's very complex to run the world. You've got 190 countries to deal with. In a congressional office, you are so busy. You have so many issues. You have th literally thousands of issues to consider. You've got all the domestic issues, all the economic issues, the, the, the foreign policy issues. And you couldn't even name. I mean, what person can name every country in the world? Nobody can. Uh, what person... Uh, in Washington can name all the repressive regimes that Washington is supporting. Even Obama, as smart as he is, I, I bet he couldn't, if you just asked him off the top of his head, name all the people, that Wash uh, name all the governments that Washington is give giving arms to. I bet he wouldn't be able to. He'd probably get about 60, 70 percent of them. Uh, when you're dealing with such a, a vast uh, machine, this gives uh, all sorts of openings. So we could go into congressional offices and give them a whole presentation about this, these horrible massacres of, uh, of civilians, uh, about how uh, this delivers zero benefits uh, to the average uh, American, how by stopping uh, the arming uh, of, these, uh, uh, of these killers, it's not going to hurt. Uh, anyone here in uh, in the United States, and the basic reaction of a lot of them is, "Oh, okay." Uh, they'd never really heard of Timor before, even though they are policymakers. Because, as I said, it's a very long list of, uh, of countries. When when you're running the world, there are only there are a few specialists in the Pentagon and the State Department who work on on each country, uh, and. That's what a lot of the interactions consisted of. Oh, there's East Timor? Okay. Uh, I wasn't really aware of that, but tell me about it. We're doing these things? Oh, okay. Sometimes there is resistance because the administration would come in and lobby uh, uh, on the other side. Uh, but then, you know, you counteract uh, what they say with, uh, with well-documented facts. You get a few people in the congressional district uh, to weigh in. So uh, the office has, uh, you know, 20 people from the district that are saying cut off the arms and nobody from the district who's saying continue the arms. Uh, and, you know, step by step. But in terms of like hardcore, you know, ongoing activists, it was never more than a few hundred yeah. at, at maximum. You know, a, a few hundred, a few dozen in, in an ongoing way. With just a force of that kind, uh, it was possible over time to, uh, to fight arcane congressional battles and, and win them. And you could probably do that in several dozen other cases. Israel-Palestine is different because Israel-Palestine uh, is, is, uh, is at near the top of the U.S. political agenda. Uh, and it's massively covered by the press. And that has both pros uh, and, uh, uh, and cons. Um, I think a, a lot could be accomplished by setting up a, uh, uh, a grassroots uh, activist and lobbying uh, 
uh, effort that uh, brought some accurate facts to, uh, uh, to, to members of Congress. Uh, you're up against a very powerful uh, lobby, as, as did not exist in the case of uh, Indonesia <coughs> and, uh, and Timor. But now, that lobby runs free. You know, APAC and their associates, they have, they have free reign of Congress. There is almost, uh, uh, there is almost nothing on the, uh, uh, on the other side. Um, the constituencies that are active at the, uh, the district level are um, uh, overwhelmingly giving the, you know, uh, uh, pro-Israel, pro-IDF uh, uh, line. Uh, it's almost unopposed. Um, but if you mounted a, uh, an effort on, uh, on the other side, I, I think there's a fair amount that could be accomplished. I don't think you could reverse U.S. policy, as was done in the case of Indonesia uh, and Timor, but you might well be able to, uh, to modify it, to, uh, uh, to constrain it. Um, and there's real potential in the fact that this is something that's in the press spotlight. Uh, there was no press on the, you know, the, the, the battle on, on Indonesia Timor. Uh, if you actually got something lo like that going on Israel-Palestine, uh, you could really get some attention. And who knows where it would lead. Uh, I'll just add before I get to you, Mitch. Um, the utter incompetence of the Indonesian lobbying effort, I just we can't take credit for, shouldn't be underestimated, particularly because they're now much more sophisticated. I, I actually occasionally talk to the Indonesian ambassador to the U.S. They never would, you know, basically just send their lackeys out to photograph us as we protested in the past. But they would, they were so, they took U.S. support so much for granted, they didn't work, ha need to work that hard to uh, prop it up. They got what they wanted and needed without really having to ask much. Um, you know, until 1991, 92. And, um, you know, and th so they w their uh, interaction with Congress, from what I could tell, was just a few key uh, committee and subcommittee heads, and actually, in many ways, the wrong committee, which was the uh, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations Committees, and not the Appropriations Committees, where we focused our effort. And, uh, you know, Alan mentioned 20 calls. It often was two or three calls yeah. they would get from a district. And, you know, and because it was such a low-profile issue, and it's very puzzling. You know, Indonesia is very large, as we now know, uh, very strategic to the U.S., <coughs> which is, I think, even true, you know, as true then as it is now. And, uh, you know, that it could be so under the, the radar. You know, how little offices knew about Indonesia outside of the handful. And then the ones that became our staunchest allies, you know, who were relatively new in Congress. You know, uh, the Nita Lowys, and, you know, some of these are terrible on other issues, or uh, Patrick Kennedy. Um, you know, because we, we got the, uh, Russell Feingold. You know, they were talked to, you know, as, you know, in the early stages, in essence, of their careers in Congress. And then, you know, kind of moved up the food chain of seniority. And, you know, and we're able to do a lot of that in insider um, dealing. But we also had a model, which I'm surprised Alan didn't mention because he helped create it, that we looked to when we got our first victories, which was Guatemala, which I think was the first country to get its IMET cut off. And I remember sitting with uh, Alan and I think Patrick Leahy's office, who had put that provision in about Guatemala, saying you should be doing the same thing and more for Indonesia and Timor, which you know, they agreed in, to in, in principle and you know, followed through on ever since. The U.S. gets away with the targeted assassinations and all the you know, extra legal uh, renditions and everything, partly, not only just through pure force, but partly also because of the media's influence on our, you know, on our minds and the public mind here. And that includes, I think, part of the left media. So if you look at such issues like Libya recently and how the left, or, or if you want to consider I'll just be part of the left, which I shouldn't do, but, you know, how they portrayed Libya, how they portrayed Congo, how they portrayed Yugoslavia, you know, all of that influenced us in ways, I believe, that demobilized us and didn't allow us to see what the interests of the U.S. government 
and they go, we're doing in these places. And so the, the media is a double-edged pen, right? Um, yes, it can help us mobilize, but it also helps us demobilize in a lot of ways. And it seems to me that we have to really look into that and the responsibility, especially in the left media, in looking for so different sources, taking sources from different places than the you know, corporate media does and so forth. For instance, and I'll, I'll just end on this. Um, Alan, you were saying how, I mean, I appreciate your op optimism, right? And I usually I'm consider myself that way as well. But the U.S. has been putting in all sorts of repressive infrastructure that will round, you know, there are now quarantine camps throughout the United States built by Halliburton under the CDC. So it didn't come through the direct military response, oh, you're going to be a protester, we're going to put you in a concentration camp. But it comes through a different guise, through the health, the health guys, or the uh, or the tax its own citizens, but just blames it on so-called terrorists, or foreign terrorists. You know, and so it gets away. The media gets away with putting that in our heads, so that it demobilizes us, and we don't see the real um, significance of what I would say the ruling class is doing through the media including through the left media at times, or the so-called left media at times. The, the idea of demobilization, I think that is an important idea. Um, and I think that a fair amount of what you call left-wing thinking in recent decades um, has done that to, to itself. Uh, this idea, the, it's very easy you know, it, it kind of goes in parallel to the, there was this big trend in the academic world, the Western American academic world, in these recent decades of, uh, you know, postmodernism and post this and post that. And one of their basic concepts was that power is everywhere. Uh, everywhere you turn, there's a, there's a manifestation of power, not just in the obvious things like, you know, police and uh, prisons. Uh, but in every aspect of life, every aspect of social, everywhere you turn, you see a manifestation of the, the oppressive power of, of society. And you start thinking that way. And pretty soon, you know, you're ready to curl up in a ball and just, you know, hide at the bottom of your, uh, hide at the bottom of your, your bathtub. And you see this, one of the, you know, it's very interesting. In states where you have where you're in a historical moment where there's real repression. Like, for example, uh, contemporary Burma or Aceh in, in the recent period. They had these vast in, intel, intelligence apparatuses. And they would have people on the payroll, all kinds of people on the payroll. In, in Papua, uh, the Copasis, the, the, the U.S. trained Red Berets, uh, they have this intelligence apparatus and they put all sorts of people on their payroll, uh, people who are clerks, who, who sell uh, cell phones, uh, people who are OJEC drivers, little motorcycle uh, taxis, uh, farmers. And so the idea is not just that they receive information from these people, not just that these people can help them finger kidnapping and assassination targets, but also that the word gets out in society, oh, the Copasis, they're everywhere. You never know who's Copasis, so you've got to be very careful what, what you say. He might be Copasis, you know, she might be Copasis. You've got to watch yourself. In Burma, in recent years, similar, military intelligence, what, what, what it is there, uh, people will say, military intelligence is here, they're there, they're behind every tree. This is one of the most powerful weapons that the regime has, because you start imagining all sorts of, uh, of things. And, um, you know, I think also in the United States, even though we are not in a, a time and place of, of that kind of repression, we imagine all sorts of obstacles and all sorts of powers that aren't really there. Uh, they're not, they're not going to put uh, demonstrators in concentration camps in the United States. That's, that's not going to happen. Far from that. Um, the, I think it's, it's a much more useful angle to come from, is to look at them and realize in many ways how weak they are.
uh, how uh, you know that you know don't do not look at the man behind the screen uh, from uh, the Wizard of Oz. The, the the man behind the screen can be pretty small and uh, and and pathetic. Uh, I think there's much more weakness there than we realize. My God, in these we've just seen the examples. All these countries in the Middle East where they faced true true repressive uh, regimes and they were able to topple them. And here we're facing basically an open system where over the years the direct instruments of repression have been whittled down and down and down in part because of popular uh, demand and in part because those who run the system realize, oh, we don't really need this anymore. So we retire that technique, we retire this technique, uh, you know, uh, and so it evolves into a fairly open system where the big people still win, but they win because of the way the game plays out. That's different from a jackboot police state, very, very different, and it means uh, that there's a lot more space uh, for uh, taking protest to some, uh, you know, s some amazing limits, some amazing uh, places. And I, I think we have a very, very open field in the United States, and we have to realize uh, how open it is now. I, th I think that's uh, the key uh, concept at the moment. I really disagree. I mean, we have the drug, <laughs> the drug wars in which millions of people are in prison. They just aren't doing it saying, you're a demonstrator, go to jail. They'll do it through other definitions. Yeah. Oh, it's, you know, it's very, it's, it's certainly very complex. Because in some respects, you know, the U.S. Uh, uh, is one of the more repressive systems in the world. You have one percent, roughly 1% 1 of the population uh, in prison. Uh, you know, in excess of 2% of the African-American population in prison. In terms of executions, uh, the U.S. ranks with uh, China uh, and Saudi Arabia, uh, yet um, the U.S. never manages uh, to get around to either executing or, or imprisoning uh, those who commit the biggest crimes, namely the, you know, the, the, the killings of, of civilians which take place overseas and are ordered by U.S. Uh, civilians. That's all true, but at the same time, Outside and and the the recent you know post 9/11 uh, uh, you know uses of of arbitrary powers to to kidnap uh, uh, you know anyone they want to and charge them with uh, w with terrorism, but all that said, surrounding that, surrounding those prisons, are vast open fields where people can run wild uh, politically if they choose uh, to do so, and we ought to choose to do so. So, so my talk about this that has come up a lot tonight, and one of the things I've learned is uh, about the strategic utility of both those tactical engagements that you were talking about, but also the power of, of imagination. And, um, you know, one of the things that you talked about, this storming of the White House, is maybe a distant dream. Um, but I'm wondering, on maybe a, a nearer horizon, if we might imagine a m more plausible coalescence that might move things in a molecular way before we scale up in a bigger way. And one, one thing I was thinking of is, is just uh, the appropriations process. Uh, in the context of John's uh, uh, recounting of that history of, of uh, learning to do these teamwork activism from Guatemala, you know, what, what are the possibilities of forming alliances amongst all the different groups working on um, IMET, working on foreign military financing, and maybe bring this to Occupy, and, and maybe that's the second part of what John just said. Uh, the announcement is that uh, on the, is it the 27th of January, uh, we're going to be doing Occupy Freeport at Occupy Wall Street, 60 Wall Street, uh, and John will uh, distribute more information on that in the future. But, but I guess back to the question is, where, where are we at with the appropriations process, and what are the possibilities of, of a broader alliance outside of, you know, East Timor, outside of West Papua, but sort of looking for a broader coalition to unite around that, where that issue? Well, it's a really good question. There wasn't really time to talk about all these possible interim steps. I mean, one thing I think sh this should be said first is that although the, you know, the whole Occupy Wall Street 
the movement has happened to be there at, at the moment when this uh, this crack occurred in the uh, in the political earth you know when the tectonic plate shifted in in, in US politics uh, it's it's not a matter of uh, you know in, in looking forward to what can be done this spring here in the US what what can be done uh, this year uh, it's not just a matter of what will the Occupy movement uh, do uh, hopefully that could be the first of many uprisings from, of many different kinds of people pushing in many different uh, uh, pushing in, in me, from many different angles um, the uh, and there are all sorts of concrete interim demands interim goals that that you can uh, imagine I think it's very important you know I know there was this whole controversy here about well you know a lot of people said oh Occupy Wall Street doesn't have specific demands um, I think at that stage that wasn't really a problem because the problem in the US was very broad, very complex, affected a lot of people. And so you had a movement that was broad, that raised many issues, raised many demands, although all tending in, in what direction. And that was able to encompass a lot of people. That made sense. But it's not going to actually accomplish anything until you start demanding and pushing for specific concrete things. And you could even have a situation where as you activate this broad grassroots surge, actual conditions in the country move backwards. You know, in Spain, before the Occupy movement was launched here, they had a very similar movement which was much bigger in terms of popular participation. Their crowds were massive, uh, proportionally much bigger than here. And the one concrete thing that has happened in Spain since then is that the heirs to the uh, Franco dictatorship have now been uh, elected as the new government uh, of Spain, uh, which means they are going to impose austerity and cuts even worse than the, the incumbent socialist uh, government was, was already uh, imposing in, uh, in Spain. A similar kind of thing could, uh, 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 could happen here. So you, you have to have specific uh, demands, all sorts of things could be pushed for. For example, I, I understand that uh, earlier this year, um, uh, a grassroots uh, group in, in Newark, the People's Organization for Progress, uh, which is now, they're now in day, what is it? I think it's day 173 of a, uh, uh, an ongoing protest and picket in front of the county courthouse and demanding a national jobs program. Uh, a WPA style uh, program, you know, nationally for the United States. They've been demanding that in Newark. Uh, they came to the Occupy Assembly a couple of times and they proposed that as a national demand and program. And although they got majorities, they did not get the 90% supermajority, so it was defeated. Um, but that kind of, that kind of thing, um, could be pushed, and that's the kind of thing that could get very broad support um, uh, from all sorts of sectors in, in, in the United States. And it doesn't necessarily have to come out of an Occupy assembly. It could come from, you know, uh, another direction. In terms of U.S. support for foreign uh, repression, and what you were asking about specifically with the appropriations process, um, you know, a group of people could just start. This would be a very useful exercise. Just get out the two bills, the Defense Appropriations Bill, the Foreign Operations uh, Appropriations Bill, and just run through the different places where uh, the U.S. is sending weapons, uh, sending training. You'd also have to do some research for, for the covert programs, but many of them are not really covert. They, they appear at one time or another in, in the press, for example, you know, the U.S. is running a massive covert war against Iran, uh, which everybody in Washington kind of knows about, but it's not discussed publicly. And, you know, there are all sorts of things going on. You could just go through that and pick targets. 
uh, pick uh, uh, cases where you want to try to cut off this appropriation or cut off that appropriation. And then when you have mass mobilizations, you could find out the ports from which uh, arms are being uh, shipped. You could find out the bases uh, from which, uh, you know, where uh, trainers from the given country are coming in uh, for their training, uh, from which the U.S. trainers are being dispatched. Uh, you could find out the bases, like those near Las Vegas, uh, where, uh, from which the drone strikes are being uh, launched. And you could go to those places. And while some people are, you know, working in, uh, in Washington and uh, working the phones, bombarding uh, Congress, saying, cut off this appropriation, cut off that program, another group of people could be sitting in and on the roads, you know, around that military base or outside those port from which those weapons are being uh, uh, shipped. You know, the, because the U.S. has such a vast killing machine in place, there are more targets than you could even begin to deal with. I mean, there are literally hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of, of cases um, where atrocities are being committed because of Washington decisions and where you could en envision a, a specific program to stop them. But, you know, you could start by choosing a few. Uh, and it could be Indonesia, Papua. It could be something, uh, you know, it, it, it could be something else. Uh, the, the point is to begin it. And it's, it's especially, it can be especially powerful if you have the, the, the mass mobilization aspect. We didn't have that with, with ETAN. You know, we did demonstrations uh, and, and rallies, but that's very different from a big uh, sit-in somewhere. And the, the big sit-in is, is a much more powerful tool, uh, especially if it's coordinated with, uh, you know, specific action in Washington. So there, there's, a, there's a tremendous amount of stuff that can be done. That kind of the biggest problem is you don't know where to begin in, in, uh, uh, in choosing, but it's, it's a, they're very good opportunities to get very concrete. The assertion made several times is that we may or may not be in a period where the rules can be rewritten here in this country. And I just wondered what you think, since obviously we don't really know right now, and you may turn out to be very right or not so right. Should that affect what we do right now? Like, does it really make any difference today to what we choose to do? Like, if we're, say, we're passionate about seeking change and we're mobilized in some way. Whether this is a you know, potentially historic time or not, should that influence what we do? I'd say in one sense, no. In another sense, yes. Uh, I, I think what you're driving at is, first for the no part, you have to try even if the chances of success are virtually hopeless. Um, you know, and if you think about some examples, that becomes intuitively uh, obvious. You know, if uh, if someone breaks into your house and they're wielding a gun and they're about to shoot down your family, well, of course you should throw yourself in front of the gun, even though odds are you're going to die, uh, and your family's going to die too. But you should do that anyway. Uh, y uh, y you must uh, try. Uh, and you should always try, even if the, the prospects of success are absolutely minimal. That's one point. But another point is that, in a sense, an analogy like uh, an image like that is kind of misleading because politics are more complex than that. And often in politics, uh, you don't really know what's going to result from your action. I mean, I doubt very much uh, that that man in Tunisia who set himself uh, on fire uh, because he was abused by the security forces when trying to sell his wares, I really doubt that he realized that he was about to touch off a possible world revolution. But he did. Uh, you just don't know. Uh, third, Right now, we kind of do know, because there's a fair amount of evidence that has come in recently about the current situation in the world. 
Um, in 2008, we had uh, a, a shocking crisis uh, for the system. And we had a situation where the rules were suspended and rewritten temporarily, only they were suspended and rewritten by the rich. In a matter of weeks, in the fall and uh, early months of, of 2008, all the standard uh, procedures, uh, which are very complex, I mean, there are, there are volumes of rules and laws governing these things, uh, g governing financial transactions and government relations with financial institutions and so on, all of that was thrown in the trash uh, and Hank Paulson and uh, uh, Geithner and a few other people sat around uh, uh, small tables uh, in Washington and here in Manhattan and just kind of, uh, you know, tossing ideas back and forth among themselves. They decided the fate of trillions of, of dollars. Uh, you know, they made fundamental policy choices completely unconstrained by the rules that ex existed <coughs> as of a couple weeks before. That was the rich. Uh, suspending and rewriting the rules to their own advantage for a time. Since then, there's been a reaction to that. Uh, and uh, there have been all these related things happening, uh, you know, the upri successful uprisings in the, uh, in, in the Middle East, the, uh, uh, the U.S. stepping in and attempting to salvage uh, what it could by backing the bombing of, uh, uh, of, of Libya, the uh, uh, the extraordinary uh, Tea Party movement, uh, which is r really an interesting phenomenon because it was kind of the elements of the very rich in the U.S. organizing this revolt against themselves, <laughs> you know, bringing, uh, bringing people, uh, kind of shades of Chairman Mao and the, uh, the, the, the Cultural Revolution in a, uh, in a sense, you know, organizing a, a revolt against his, his own regime. You know, these rich, they dominated the U.S., government and system, but they wanted to dominate it more. Uh, so they, they got grassroots people uh, into the streets chanting against Wall Street, against bailouts uh, uh, for Wall Street, against money corruption of uh, politics, uh, all this amazing uh, stuff. And, you know, they, they won, they made headway in Congress, they won a number of concrete uh, victories. Um, but now, but then there's the a reaction from uh, the non-rich uh, in the U.S. in the Occupy Wall Street movement. And all this together suggests that maybe it is possible to rewrite some rules now. Maybe that kind of momentary power, and it's always momentary, you know, those moments often don't last more than months or even weeks or even days sometimes. <coughs> But that kind of thing may be in reach. There's rational reason to think that. So, you know, to wrap it up, even though when it's totally futile, you should try. You should especially try when it looks like you have a chance at massive uh, victory that could potentially save uh, millions of, of lives, that could change the economic uh, circumstances of lots of uh, people here in the U.S. that can put food in the mouths of people who otherwise would die. That's, that's even more uh, reason to, uh, to do so. Um, so yeah, I think it does matter. Henry Kissinger has been quite active in this past year, flogging his book on China, and for some reason appearing as a guest speaker at all kinds of charity fundraisers around the country, I've noticed. He, of course, uh, on December 6th, the day before the U.S., uh, excuse me, Indonesia invaded East Timor, uh, gave the go-ahead with uh, President uh, Ford to Suharto, saying, don't worry about your weapons and your U.S. military training. We'll find a way around U.S. law. That was the specific concern Suharto had and brought to the U.S., uh, which, of course, uh, Ford and his successors, Carter, uh, and others, you know, did up until 1999 and up until the cutoffs began in the 1990s. I think we've had four demonstrations, supported a couple others around the country. So we'll continue to highlight the U.S. Uh, responsibility and culpability in the oppression of East Timor.
uh, in the support of Suharto. I think as we showed in the 90s, that by the U.S. cutting assistance, it does have an impact and an influence on uh, the Indonesian military's behavior, in fact. Their announcement that they would respect the result of the referendum uh, came literally within hours of uh, President Clinton as he was hopping across uh, the Pacific to go to the APEC summit in New Zealand, announced the final little cutoff of everything to Indonesia. And the Indonesian, you know, and Alan used to say that, and we used to just you know, kind of humor him that he said, if, if, the, US, if it, the U.S. ever cut off the Indonesian military, they would decide within hours <laughs> that East Timor wasn't worth it, that you know, they'd rather have the U.S. Uh, military backing than he were in. I want to admit I was wrong. It has uh, some oil wealth, uh, certainly enough to, to stay in tune with its ability to spend as a fairly new government, but has decided, and I think after much convincing by international institutions like the Asia Development Bank and the World Bank, that it, sh it should borrow money, that interest rates are so low. Yeah. Um, so that they, we have uh, over the past year with East Timorese and actually with other groups in the, particularly in the Southeast Asia region who know very well what borrowing has meant to countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, uh, Thailand, um, you know, campaigned against that. And even though the decision has made, it's a relatively uh, small amount of money, certainly in the international scheme of things. I think it's like 80 million was put in the last budget and uh, including a couple of uh, members of parliament said through and said you know we need a road so uh, Charlie Scheider wrote you know kind of learning uh, the uh, US art of uh, earmarking <laughs> said why don't we earmark another 10 million dollar loan so we can get our road um, so they've budgeted 80 million and uh, you know, I, you know, we'll continue to be working with, with groups and people in East Timor to uh, s prevent additional borrowing if we can, and, and at least help educate. Uh, and it was actually a big topic of debate throughout East Timorese society uh, about taking this step uh, of you know, entering the uh, international loan market and hopefully understanding what that may mean for the long term, you know, especially by looking what it has meant for other countries similarly East Timor that have uh, you know, borrowed in the past. Um, and then the other thing we're hoping to do is um, ETAN has <coughs> had monitors at every East Timor election since the referendum, including the referendum. Some have been fairly large projects, like for the referendum and like for the elections five years ago. And there are actually three people in this room that were uh, with the town project observing uh, East Timor's uh, presidential and parliamentary elections uh, five years ago. They're having elections again this year and we're hoping to ha again have election monitors in East Timor and it's something the East Timorese uh, want from us um, and want and know that you know, when we monitor elections, uh, you know, we're not just looking at, at election day so that's part of it, but uh, you know, looking at the whole election process, um, and uh, particularly looking at the aftermath, because um, uh, it may be exaggerated, but and there was some violence after the election five years ago. There were, certainly was major violence after the referendum in 1999, uh, but that that folks will be there to help to to uh, monitor the whole process and monitor its implement implementation when there's a new parliament uh, following the elections. Um, I will uh, leave it at that. Um, Al and I were together in East Timor in September 1999, uh, staying at the same house in the last days before I left. Um, Alan chose to remain. ETAN does a lot with very little resources, which I think is true, but we, we'd rather do a lot with more resources, particularly in this anniversary year.